What's stroking out my all of Europe because of because of the heat and the lack of air conditioning and the houses built to retain heat and the the climate change? H- how you doing, Europe? Everybody okay? Are you talking about probably not? Uh, are you talking about the rough. runway that literally melted? <laughs> literally, Sophie, melted? it's forty <laughs> C over there, which in real people numbers is like a lot. Miles, do you know Celsius? Do you understand Celsius? Yeah, Miles like Gray, 113. everybody. 113. Mm-hmm. 113. Co-host of the Daily Zeitgeist. Miles. Yeah. Why why do why do they use different numbers over there for the temperature? We all know, man. They just yeah. want to lord that shit over us yeah. because we kicked England's ass. We fucking okay. owned their asses. <laughs> um, and then so we owned why. the only other country in Europe, Germany. Yeah. That's right. So the two, that's two Europeans. Two, man. Mm-hmm. That's right. We, that, that's the thing. We got Bring all the it. Thanos stones uh for kicking ass. Miles. We both know how terrible the United States is. What is, why do we have, why is there such joy as an American in making fun of Europe? What is it, what is that about us? I think because we know that we have no history. Mm -hmm. So that really, it's like, you know, it's like when you have like a dumb sports argument and like there's that one thing someone can say about your team that's so fucking true and Mm -hmm. you you just, it it just upsets you, but then you can't do anything about it. That's like when like Europeans are like, but you have no history here. It's everything is new, or like McDonald's or blah blah. And you're like, "Fuck you, man!" Yeah. And you're like, "No, that's true. That's true because yeah. it's all stolen and <laughs> yep, yep, built yep. over." No, shit. I've, I uh-huh. have drank in a bar in Dublin that is like was has been in operation since before Columbus was a war criminal. Like it's <laughs> right. <laughs> like <laughs> that's so. Yeah. Um, Yo, but it's now so you wild. guys are toasty. So there. <laughs> yeah. Hold that. But what's funny is too, like in Spain, they know better. In Spain, they're like, "Yo, you're out no. in the middle of the day, stupid." Mm-hmm. No, they, no, they're they're like, no. "Look, we 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 have yielded to capitalism in many ways, but we're not giving up our naps yeah. in the four hours in the middle of the day." Very jealous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's forty. Mm-hmm. It's forty-two, my yeah. man. It's in I'm real one people out. numbers. That's like what seventy? Jesus, I don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. Hi to them. You yeah. know what everyone does know, Miles? Mm. That Clarence Thomas is a real piece of shit. Oh, oh shit! <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Yeah, Clarence yeah. Thomas is a real. We, he's he's a real one. We started this say. episode with some good old fashioned American chauvinism because most of this episode is going to be talking about a number of things that are terrible in our nation's history. Because the history of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, the man who probably did more than any other single government official to end Roe v. Wade and is doing his best to end a number of other civil rights mm-hmm. um, is also the story of like everything that's terrible about this country and its history. Like it's amazing how much shit is packed into this guy's life and how much like <laughs> fucked up stuff. I mean, number one, you're going to be pretty sympathetic to this dude for the early part of this. Um, and I, I have to say one of the things like I want to start this, I guess, with like an admission for me. I think he's probably the bastard's pod subject I've been wrongest about. Um, because mm-hmm. for a long time, I we I, I'd never even thought of doing him until pretty recently. Not that right. I didn't think he sucked, but like his years of like he's a, you know number one for a very long time he was viewed as like Justice Scalia's sidekick, basically. Um, mm-hmm. And people who knew anything about the Supreme Court were generally aware that that was not fair. But I'm not a Supreme Court knower, Miles. <laughs> like, that's not <laughs> my is? that's not my my strength. <laughs> um, <laughs> but even so, he's got years of like I knew he had all these like cruel things he'd written in dissents and all this like regressive shit that he'd championed. So like I I never doubted that he was a bastard. But again, there's a reason why we don't cover everyone who just sucks on this show. Mm -hmm. And it's because like, also they need to be interesting because this is entertainment too. Right. And I, I (laughs) kind of thought like, well, he's just like a shitty guy who became a judge. How much could there possibly be in that fucking life story? And now we're (laughs) going to do a four parter on him. So (laughs) holy shit. (laughs) I was very wrong about this guy. So let me start by admitting that. Okay. (laughs) So this is like uh, we're getting a true, Mm-hmm. We're getting the origin story yeah. of, of the villain. And a lot of weird, shitty stuff. Spoilers, we're going to be talking about pubic hair. Oh, yeah. No, yep. I, okay. I, know, I remember that part. Uh huh. Now, oh, but I don't know if you remember this part, Miles. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm sorry. That... <laughs> I forgot where I was, where I learned about all the things I didn't mm-hmm. know I didn't mm-hmm. want to know. That, was, that right. was a horrendously evil laugh, and I did I not yeah, I've been working it. on it. I've been working on it. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> Miles, I'm, trying to... I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I, well, I went no, to a, I I went to to this, a class so. hosted by the Riddler this weekend about unleashing your inner Batman villain. And uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, look, I don't want to like, I don't want to like, I don't want to like toot my own horn because I'm early in the process, but I did just kidnap a billionaire's son. So oh, okay. a little bit of applause, a little bit of applause. Okay. I'm working cool. on it. It's got to yeah. be good. Well, that's great. So cool. Miles, if you casually read about Clarence Thomas, the way most people do, because who's got the time to really know that much about the Supreme Court? Well, we all do now because it's an immediate threat to all of our futures. <laughs> um, but if you if you read these like real casual breakdowns of him, you'll learn a couple of things. He's very conservative. He never talks during oral arguments. He's been known as the silent justice for that reason, um, although that's changed kind of recently. And he got his start as Justice Scalia's like he was kind of his lickspittle, right? He would vote the same way Scalia did all the time. That's at least what mm-hmm. people would say about him. And then, of course, there is the fact that he sexually harassed Anita Hill, who was questioned by Congress and ultimately ignored when Thomas was voted in on the narrowest margin in Supreme Court history. That's like the the baseball card, you know, version of Clarence Thomas's history. <laughs> right. Stats. Mm-hmm. Right. The stats, right? Mm-hmm. All of that is technically true, um, with the exception of him being Justice Scalia's lick spittle. We'll talk about that later. Um, but it turns out it's also all so incomplete that I now feel not going into detail about the life and beliefs of Clarence Thomas is kind of a disservice. So here we go. Clarence Thomas uh, was born on June 23rd, 1948, in an unpowered wooden shack on the edge of a tidal swamp near the small town of Pinpoint, Georgia. Um, as you might have guessed from everything in that last sentence, he was born into the kind of poverty that most of us who are capable of listening to podcasts can only dimly comprehend. Very mm. few, even as bad as poverty is in the, very few people exist in that kind of poverty in the United mm-hmm. States this day, right? Um, like it is, he is, he is living, this is 1948, he's living with access to like 1840s technology for the most part, right? Like that is this kid's childhood. That's this kid's, right. like the world he comes into. Um, his great, great grandmother had been born into slavery uh, and emancipated at age nine because of, there's this war. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. um, she had a son uh, and that her son had several young kids and then abandoned those kids, leaving her to take care of them. So that's his grandmother uh now one of his grandmother's son's kids who gets abandoned by her son is a guy named myers anderson who is clarence's grandfather on his mother's side um myers refused to ever speak about his own father but he also would follow in his footsteps so myers has a daughter leola williams um who is clarence's mom um and leola is born out of wedlock her mother myers is uh, partner dies in a subsequent childbirth when she's three. Uh, now Myers is not the kind of guy who wants to have daughters. He thinks that's kind of a waste of time. So he decides mm. he's not going to raise his daughter and he sends her to pinpoint Georgia where she's raised by his sister, her aunt. Um, her, <laughs> her aunt is not a nurturing kind of person. Uh, it's a very strict upbringing and there's never any belief that like Leola is going to have a future, right? Like she does not mm-hmm. have prospects. Um, Aunt Ani was illiterate, um, so Leola doesn't really learn how to read uh, as a little girl. Um, and Aunt Ani keeps her kind of ward, whatever you want to call her, from playing with other children. She doesn't want to let her socialize. She wants to keep strict control over her so she doesn't get pregnant young like it tends to happen. Uh, mm-hmm. Leola was so desperate for some kind of childhood that she made dolls for herself out of clumps of weed, washing the roots to simulate hair. So, like, again, when we're talking about how poor these people are, Clarence's wow. mom is making dolls out of clumps of weed. Right. Like weeds. Like, that is... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's like a, so that's that's, like a level. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. And, like, every, when you always talk about parenting, it's like, mm-hmm. we're all just trying to break cycles. You know, yeah. Like, what our grandparents did and what they did. So, that's where we're starting here. Yeah. It's, like you're saying, sen- like centuries past. Mm-hmm. You, you've got centuries of slavery and families being forcibly broken up, and then a pretty bad pattern gets started by um by Myers's father, who leaves the family, and Myers doesn't abandon his kids because he has a relationship with them, but he also doesn't right. want to take care of daughters, so he just kind of shuffles them off to whatever the oldest member of his family is, right? right. And that person's like, well, if you have any kind of freedom, you're clearly going to have even more kids before you're ready for them, so I'm going to basically make you live in a prison. So that's how Leola grows up. Cool. Um, when she's 16, 
she gets pregnant anyway uh, with Clarence's older sister, Emma May, and she drops out of school. Um, Leola was still a teenager when she had Clarence, a little bit after she has Emma May. Uh, the shack that they lived in was insulated with newspaper and caulked with library paste. That was, again, like, that's what they have access to, right? Like, Ooh. where are things free? What is it that you can get mm-hmm. your hands on in order to, like, fill holes in your house? Just right. Just about as desperate as it gets. Yeah. Um, Clarence's younger brother was born a little more than a year after him. Now, you will notice that I have not talked a lot about their father. Uh, Clarence Thomas's dad is known as M.C. Thomas. Um, and the reason he doesn't show up in this story much is that because as soon as he has three kids with Leola, he abandons her and his family because he's gotten someone else pregnant uh, and her dad threatened to shoot him if he didn't marry her. So <laughs> we, this is a rough oh start, my right? <laughs> God. Like you, I think it's f- yeah. This is like the okay, so it's the worst parts of everything. Go on. This it is like one of those. If you were if you were like writing this background for like a fictional character, people would be like, "All right, well, maybe pick like one of these things." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. An editor would be like, "It feels like you're putting a hat on top of a hat." Yeah, with the, and it's how vivid this uh, history of suffering is. Yeah, it is. It is deeply difficult um and it, it's worth noting the community in pinpoint this kind of upbringing is not common for other people who live in pinpoint which is a, a black mm. community um it is a very traditional community it is very uncommon there for a father to leave his family or for children to be born outside of wedlock everyone is extremely religious here so mm. from the start clarence doesn't just grow up with all of this going on in his family, which is tremendously difficult. He's also ostracized. It is made clear to him by other people in the area that his upbringing is fundamentally different oh, and like no. fucked up, right? Holy like, shit. Yeah. Okay, um, right. So, oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> this is fucking spooking me out, man. Because it's so... We we constantly look at figures like this, like especially in, this, especially mm-hmm. in the Supreme Court, where it, you're looking at this idea that mm-hmm. You know, on a whim, they can con- curtail all these human rights. And we're just like, how the fuck? Could, what's going on with you that you think it's all good? And to hear this story even start for this early on, I'm like, oh, fuck. This sound again, this sounds like yeah, c- centuries of like compounded negativity, suffering, coming together to form like this human being. And you're like. Oh, my God, of course. Like, it's, you can't fathom it. Yeah, and it's, I mean, this is probably why it's a bad idea to just, like, pick nine random people uh, and be right. like, yeah. you, you you are our god Ooh. kings now. Yeah. <laughs> That's like. Because all sorts of shit might have gone on in their backgrounds that make them do real wild shit and maybe. Yeah. That's not good. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, you don't have to have had this background to wind up trapped in the... Nearly everybody winds up kind of trapped in the past to some extent. You know, maybe you just love the music of the 1990s. But everybody, everybody like, winds up growing up with something that you never quite move past, right? Which is why one of the many reasons why people shouldn't be able to hold too much power over each other. Because we develop all these weird fucking hang-ups. And Mm -hmm. it's best to just kind of minimize the damage that can do. Is, is right. my attitude. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, we've covered some desperate origin show, stories on this show, but I have to say, like, Clarence Thomas's early childhood is like, it's up there, you know? Um, hmm. That is that is rough. Um, his dad, you know, again, leaves as soon as he gets another woman pregnant. It's possible that Clarence's dad was bigamously married. Um, the legalities here are very unclear. But uh, none of his kids were planned. In general, that was not super common um, with his family. Uh, his mother later told interviewers, quote, we didn't know anything about birth control or where babies came from. When you got pregnant, you just had it. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. As I said earlier, Clarence grows up aware that he's not living with the kind of family that most kids have. You know, everyone is extremely pinpoint, like money isn't a thing anybody has. But most kids have fairly stable family networks um, and, you know, are born kind of with at least that in their lives. Mm -hmm. Clarence is aware that he's missing something. Uh, A black journalist who knew Thomas when he was growing up told Jane Mayer and Jill Abrams and the journalist, I believe, is anonymous for 
understandable reasons. Uh, Jane Mayer and J Jill Abrams, authors of the book Strange Justice, quote, he starts out as a little black boy not accepted in the black world. He has no money, no family. This puts him at the bottom of the pecking order among Southern blacks, a community that is far more closed-minded and rigid than many whites imagine. As soon as he was born, he was just out there, a floater. So that's one attitude, at least on his background, right? That's a single right. person's opinion. Um, yeah. Now, once his dad leaves, his mom was forced to move in with the aunt who had raised her miserably. Um, and she leaves her kids with the aunt who had raised her, this very strict woman who like has had a, a life I can't even imagine in terms of difficulty. And Clarence's mom moves to Savannah, 15 miles away, which is a lot further back then, to work as a live-in servant for a rich white family so that she could send money back home. She made $14 a day. Uh, when she visited her kids, they would regularly ask about their father. Um, and, you know, she would didn't really have a good answer for where he was. Um, and this was made more miserable by the fact that their father's father, their grandfather on their dad's side, was the town bus driver. So they had to see their grandpa every day without, like, having a relationship with them because, like, their dad was just gone. Mm. Yeah, rough. <laughs> So life in Pinpoint was extremely difficult. For, again, the poverty here is very intense. Leola, like most local women, took the job that you could get as a woman in Pinpoint, which was working at a crab and shrimp factory. Uh, this is the kind of thing that most women who grew up there spent their entire lives picking crab and shrimp out of shells uh, mm -hmm. from dawn until dusk. Leola started when she was nine, which was very common. Um, wow. This is how people spend their whole lives in fucking pinpoint. Mm. Um, it was illegal for her to start work at nine, uh, but the plant owner didn't care, and neither did the government of Georgia, and this is not a place where government inspectors come, right? right. Nobody's showing up in pinpoint to check on these people. Right, right, Because right. they are poor and black. Um, so the government doesn't give a shit what happens. Uh, as his life begins, Clarence seemed destined to a similar life path. This is what happened to most people in Pinpoint. Um, education did exist technically, but it had to be done in between brutal work shifts because you have to help your family survive. So like learning and stuff comes secondary. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you can't continue school once you have kids of your own, which often happens at like 15 or 16. A lot of folks around him are illiterate. Again, it's not it's looking like this is more or less the path he's going to wind up on just because there's not a lot of options uh, because set, uh, of segregation. Um, people in Pinpoint were not allowed to use the local beaches, the libraries or the parks. Um, all of those were outside of Pinpoint. Um, and even if they'd been able to afford traveling to such luxuries, again, there was segregation. Uh, the Constitution technically guaranteed them the right to vote, but there were poll taxes and literacy tests in Georgia uh, that mm -hmm. made it basically impossible. In the rare occasions where a Pinpoint resident would wind up in the same court as a white person, they were made to swear on sp separate Bibles. Um, this is like as Jim Crow as it gets. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is not the kind of upbringing that you would expect somebody to be able to, like, get a law degree and become a Supreme Court justice from. And it did not happen to many kids in pinpoint. Um, but in 1955, when Thomas was six, his life changed to his intense and lasting fortune. He and his brother accidentally lit their curtains on fire with a wood stove and burnt their family house to the ground. Uh, this put their great aunt. She was no longer able to take care of them. Right. Because, like, they burned the, her house down. So her mom, their mom takes them in at first, but she is living in servants quarters, which is like this filthy tenement in Savannah um, that's like built by rich people to be as small as possible. So their servants just have a place to live. Mm -hmm. um, it is a single bedroom with an outdoor toilet. Um, and it's not a kind of thing that you can really raise two boys in. Leola begged uh, their father for help. Um, he wasn't willing to do anything. So she started to beg her father, Myers Anderson, who had abandoned her for help. Um, and Myers eventually agrees to help. Um, because again, they're boys, right? He didn't really right. care about raising girls, but these are boys. Um, now I'm going to quote again from Strange Justice to talk about how Clarence would later relate what he said had happened. Quote, Thomas's recollection of how Myers Anderson came to intercede is somewhat different. He has told a number of people over the years that at about this, that time, his mother became romantically involved with a man who had no interest in taking on her children. As his friend Michael Middleton remembers it, Thomas told me his mother dumped him and his brother on the grandfather because she'd met some man. So by the age of seven, Clarence Thomas had been abandoned by both parents. Now... That could be true. She could have, like, decided to abandon them. But it seems more likely that she was just in a desperate situation and needed yeah. help from her grandfather. Clarence right. hates his mom. 
Um, right. He is like, like will be mean to her his entire life. You can have whatever opinion on that you want. I think he might have made that up. He makes a lot of stuff about his backstory up. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because that absolutely when you describe, you know, the, her living situation, how could how could anyone think like mm-hmm. that that was going to be the the place where yeah. she could have her kids grow up? Well, yeah. And Myers is kind of like if you're if you're Leola. Myers is a great person to give your kids to because Mm -hmm. unlike everyone else, you know, in your life, he has money. He gets out of pinpoint. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this in a bit, but he is doing well financially. So it's not just like, well, you're a a man in my family and I need help with these kids. It's, well, you have fucking resources. And I've literally never met another single person who has resources. (laughs) Right. Um, Right. So, yeah, Myers is not thrilled to take on new kids. Uh, He yells at Leola and he refuses at first, but then his wife threatens to leave him. uh, And so he agrees to take in both boys. Uh, Now, Clarence has an older sister, too, Emma May. Myers Anderson still refuses to help with her. He's only going to race the boys. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, Hope it's, yeah. The the worst fucking messages are constantly being reinforced. To yeah. This person as like a child. And you're, my God, like you're seeing it all start forming. Yeah. Like so early where it's like, no, uh, I have value because I'm boy. Yeah. I have value because I am boy. And like, I am being now separated from my community and given an opportunity. No one else's. And, um, yeah, a whole bunch of shit is going to, to result from this. Um, so Emma May, his sister remains living in poverty with her aunt, um, living with like family cause their house got burnt down. Um, now while up to this point, again, Clarence and his brother had been as poor as it gets. Once they move in with Myers, they're suddenly middle class instantly. Um, Mm. his life, obviously this is a fucking man who grows up in the late 1800s in Georgia, a black man. His life was grueling and tremendously difficult. Um, he had never gotten beyond a third grade education, but he had turned a push cart business into a coal ice, uh, and oil delivery business. Like he's delivering fuel to local businesses and stuff. Um, and his business has done well enough that he's bought rental properties and a small farm. Like he is extremely successful and a very intelligent man. Um, he had attempted to expand into contracting, like helping with like construction of houses in Savannah, but he had been denied a permit to make cement because of racism. Um, so he is he has hit basically Myers has hit the height of success that you're allowed to yeah. achieve as a black man in Georgia in this period of time. Right. And it's also been made very clear of him that you're not allowed to get do better than this. You right. Know? Exactly. That there are limits to it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. That said, obviously, his situation is still light years beyond what Thomas had enjoyed before. And once they're living with their grandpa, Clarence and his brother have electricity. uh, They have indoor plumbing. And most importantly, they have access to good private schools. Right. Hmm. Um, Now, in return, they have to deal with Myers Anderson. And this section from a write up in The Atlantic gives an idea of what he was like to live under. Quote, Anderson wouldn't let Thomas or his brother wear work gloves on the family farm as they cut sugarcane or helped butcher livestock. He never praised the boys or showed them affection. He feared the evil consequences of idleness, Thomas wrote in My Grandfather's Son, and so made sure that we were too busy to suffer them. In his presence, there was no play, no fun, and little laughter. Ooh, <laughs> so that's, that's cool, good. <laughs> that's all my, all my favorite homies grew up yeah. like that. Good and normal guy to raise some kids. <laughs> Holy <laughs> Hates shit. women, never smiles, makes you never hurt smiles. yourself no to work. No fucking fun. And your book mm-hmm. is still my grand, what grandpa's, my yeah. grandfather's son or whatever. Well, when Clarence grandpa. gets older, we'll talk about this, but he decides the fact that his grandpa, because his grandpa is like the right wing platonic ideal of like a grandfather, right? He's this hard working man who like doesn't cry, doesn't smile, you know, strict discipline. Um, And and even though he doesn't really get along with his grandpa in real life, once he's uh, in politics, he recognizes that his grandpa is like, that's a money-making endeavor, right? You can sell that to these white Republicans, like that you had this this strict background. And because he was so strict, we got so far, you know? Yeah, Um, I wasn't able to be too black because I was, my my grandfather made sure there was no riff-raffian stuff happening. Like it's, it's really, God, it's so fucking grim again (laughs) with every fucking layer you add to this shit. You start understanding his resentment of yeah. 
all kinds of people of women whatever and you're like it's in it's, it's wrapped in such trauma that it like you can see how that manifests into somebody with a fucking like demonic agenda like this yeah it, it it's not going to be surprising that the ends he right. reaches like are some of them will be surprising i guess but like a lot of this does make sense yeah. so thomas would later write that his grandfather oh, made yeah. sure that both boys knew that they had to quote work twice as hard to get half as far um and that like yeah that was just the way shit worked in the united states which yeah, to be I fair mean, it did yeah yeah, I mean that's I think a lot not just him, a lot of people yep. were, I, I was told that too, but it was yeah. it was twice as hard for half the pay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is like yes. I and I I have again, we've talked about like he's not an entirely credible narrator about his past. I have absolutely no whether or not his grandfather said those exact words, right. I have no sure. doubt that he wanted to get that across to those kids. Right, right. That's fucking true. Um so while Myers clearly wanted both boys to be successful, that was kind of where his concern with them ended. He wanted them to be able to make like money and be successful in society. Mm -hmm. um, he seemed to have not even money as much as he wanted them to have like a position, right? Like he wanted them to have like do make status. Yeah, exactly. Status. Yeah. He did not really seem to care about them as human beings. Um, Thomas later told colleagues in government that Myers rarely spoke to him except to order him to do chores. A Yale Law School colleague claims that Clarence told him of physical, uh, frequent physical punishments for misbehavior if he or his brother overslept. Quote, they'd have the shit beaten out of them. Um, mm. And the book Strange Justice goes into even more detail. Quote, so Thomas and his brother were made to rise before dawn and help their grandfather deliver coal and oil and spent their holidays and weekends doing heavy farm work for him. There seemed to be a tinge of cruelty in some of Anderson's weekend and some of Anderson's actions. Thomas, for instance, recalled that his grandfather had removed the heater from the fuel delivery truck because he felt that even on freezing winter mornings, heat was not conducive to good work habits. In the old fashioned way of make of many such families, challenges to authority were met with frequent and humiliating corporal punishment. A particular torture was the front hall clo uh, coat closet where according to leola williams anderson used to lock the boys when they misbehaved my daddy was hard the kids couldn't get away with nothing she recalled sometimes when her father was too tired or busy to beat the boys himself leola said he would call her to whip them for him but the little boys soon got too fast for her to catch so instead she said i would have to throw my shoes at their heads to catch them at all so harsh was the uh, so harsh was the physical punishment according to armstrong williams later thomas's aide at the eeoc that Thomas still bears a thin scar from a whipping his grandfather administered with an electrical cord. So, like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's not. It's maybe don't do that, to kids. I don't. Know. <laughs> every lay. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That. I mean, that kind of shit is so common, man. Yeah, and the the it's whole like, like older generations too. It's like <laughs> there's the common stuff, and then there's the I've removed the heater from the truck because yeah, yeah because being no. warm will make you work badly. <laughs> like, huh? Yeah, he's. The, He's got again every every layer because mm -hmm. it's like not a single thing was like good except for the like his access to like yeah. higher society. Yeah, essentially. he has access to money, but like none to affection. And again, I think the actual the physical punishments described there that is just the norm across certainly the South, right? And and right. not just the South and the United. That's everywhere, right? Like that is. That is uh, incredibly common, those attitudes that like, yeah, you're going to whip them with a fucking cord if they don't do something right. You pop a kid in the fucking face, you know, like that is like my in Oklahoma, my public fucking school spanked us and shit. And that was in the 90s. Like mm -hmm. the, the attitudes, particularly in rural areas of like uh, physical punishment towards kids are not at all uncommon in this period. It's the weird you have to be miserable. You can't let yourself relax. You can't let yourself like feel good for a moment when you're working because that will make you lazy and that's dangerous that i think is the thing that is actually really different about his upbringing right right Oof. yeah mm -hmm. it's <laughs> yeah it just it, it it's again it just freaks me out even more yeah every single thing like it, it adds to someone being even more rigid and yeah unable to see the good in anything and acts out like their powerlessness in youth in a way to feel like omnipotent even it's through if it's through destruction you're just yeah like, oh. but you know who is omnipotent through their destruction hmm. miles um which 
Which aeronautics company? <laughs> the products and services that support. You know, Miles, our primary sponsor in this podcast is the corporation who you probably know from one of their many delicious beverages but who is also building a laser to end all life on earth <laughs> see <laughs> has realized that capitalism can't continue to expand indefinitely but what can expand indefinitely is the circle of debris when we blow up the earth so <laughs> buy a fund the space laser that will end all life that's our that's our motto promo Great. code kill us all <laughs> gulp gulp <laughs> Oh, we're back. So Meyer sends the boys to a Catholic school, um, which is he is also he's a Catholic convert too, which matters to Catholics. Um, but whatever. Um, and he, he's primarily it seems like he kind of converts to Catholicism because that offers more opportunities. If you are a mm-hmm. Catholic, you can go, you can send your kids to Catholic school. Like it's a good community. But it, it provides more support, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the school he sends the kids to costs about 20 bucks a year, which even then is not expensive for a private school, right? Like that's not a fortune back in those days. Um, but it's still, I mean, it's certainly outside the reach of most families in pinpoint who probably never saw $20 in one place at the same time in their lives. Um, and more to the point, um, it's out of reach of like a lot of black people in particularly rural Georgia in that period, because it is, while it is a segregated school, it's a pretty good school um, Mm -hmm. because it's a Catholic school, right? So it has access to resources that public schools often don't. Um, It's got a more progressive background than most. It had been founded in 1878 uh, during reconstruction by a group of white Franciscan nuns who believed that black people could be good Catholics, which was real controversial at one (laughs) point. Like, oh, um, my. Wow. That's yeah. Loaded. Well, locals in, in Savannah called them the N-word nuns. Like that was. Wow. The, yeah. That's who founds this school that he goes to. And it is a good education. The nuns clearly mm-hmm. cared about teaching their students and doing so well. That right. said, they are also Catholic <clears throat> nuns in the 1950s. So they're beating the hell out of these kids. You talk right. to anybody who goes to a Catholic school in the 50s, they're getting the shit slapped out of them with rulers. <laughs> like that is, right. that's just how yeah, that stuff like goes. And shit. Right. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So again hey so how was school like pretty good were yeah. the teachers like kind of forward thinking mm-hmm. and challenge their beliefs and things no uh they beat the fuck out them. <laughs> well oh, it's even worse it's okay. like they were forward thinking for the time and also right, beat the right. fuck out of us <laughs> <laughs> actually it's a yeah. little bit from column a yeah. a little bit from column they b. believed we were people so it was important to hit us in order to make us learn <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> yeah the 50s man quite a, quite a time mm-hmm. um so yeah segregation officially ends in 1954 um that doesn't mean that kids in all white and all black schools suddenly stop going to those though right it's a process mm-hmm. um and so it's not until 1964 when thomas starts attending an elite catholic high school that he actually is in integrated classrooms so Fairly early on in his childhood, segregation legally ends, but it's not until he's in high school that he actually is in an integrated classroom. Right. Um, So he winds up, you know, uh, finally going to a school that is not like segregated based on race. And he would later call state enforced segregation, quote, as close to totalitarianism as I would like to get. Um, which is interesting because he, he's only, it actually, it ends when he's six, right? So like right at the start of his education is when segregation ends. Um, you might want to look at that as like an example of him, like kind of playing up the story. I don't think necessarily that it is. I think it more speaks to the fact that the legacy of segregation exists in his life throughout his childhood, even though, again, it ends very early on in his life. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't end because it's not a clean break. Like we often like right. to pretend There's still it momentum is. behind that. Shit. Yeah. Um, so Clarence's father remains close to a complete not non-entity for the rest of his childhood. Years later, during a speech at Pepperdine University, Clarence would give a bit of detail into one of the only interactions he ever has with his dad, 
Quote, I saw him only twice when I was young. The first time was when my mother called her parents, with whom my brother Myers and I then lived, and told them that someone at her place wanted to see us. They called a cab and then sent us to our housing project apartment, where my father was waiting. I am your daddy, he told us in a firm, shameless voice that carried no hint of remorse for his inexplicable absence from our lives. He said nothing about loving or missing us, and we didn't say much in return. It was as though we were meeting a total stranger. But he treated us politely enough, and even promised to send us a pair of Elgin watches with flexible bands which were popular at the time. Though we watched the, mall, the mail every day, the watches never came, and when a year or so had gone by, my grandparents bought, us for them, bought them for us instead. My father had broken the only promise he ever made to us. After that, we heard nothing more from him, not even a Christmas or birthday card. For years, my brother and I would ask ourselves how a man could show no interest in his own children. I still wonder. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I do feel like that's overwhelmingly the reaction to these anecdotes. Like, God I mean, they're, damn. They're so fucked up. Mm-hmm. You're like, a, you couldn't, you couldn't construct someone mm-hmm. more who has been through all this kind of like shit mm-hmm. that would make you fucking this guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, where, you you know, could, like, yeah. One of two things too. One of the, what that anecdote with his grandparents and the watches says that they've got them. The watches is yeah. one of two things is true. Either. Well, I guess one of three things is true. Either. Maybe he played up how hard his grandfather was, and there was actually more softness in that relationship than he wanted to admit, and this is an example of it. Or Mm -hmm. his dad was just so shitty that even his fucking grandfather was like, all right, like, I got to get these kids the fucking watches. Like, this is just too bad. Um, Or it's grandma, right? Or grandma was was the one who made that happen. Um, I mean, either way, I think... Even if you, even if you're lying, but that's mm-hmm. what you want. That's who you want people to think you are. Yeah, that's also pretty instructive. Like at every level, it, many things can be yeah. true. He is, just, there's they're... a lot to think about here. Yeah. Um. So when he starts high school, uh, he is a member of the first generation of his family to enjoy any kind of quality. Edu- Again, his grandfather has a third grade education. Not mm-hmm. uncommon at the time. Um. And yeah, so he is. He is the first male member of his family he and his brother because they're about the same age to go to a good high school um as the book strange justice makes clear a good deal of his opportunity here came as a result of the successes of the civil rights movement right it's not just his grandfather's success it is the fact that a lot has people have been fighting for him to have this opportunity Quote, Mm -hmm. in Thomas's first year of life, President Harry Truman, in a controversial State of the Union address, called for more extensive civil rights laws, including the establishment of some sort of fair employment practices program, the bud of the idea that eventually grew into the EEOC. The speech touched off such furious opposition in Georgia that Senator Richard B. Russell proposed exporting the state's black population to the north. Leading the fight against such racial progress was the staunch segregationist J. Strom Thurmond, the same man who would champion Thomas his nomination to the Supreme Court some four decades later. On May 17, 1954, when Thomas was five, the Supreme Court handed down its unanimous decision ordering the end of public school segregation. The lead attorney was Thurgood Marshall, then the head of the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. Marshall is who Clarence Thomas is going to replace on the Supreme mm-hmm. Court. Mm-hmm. So Grandpa Myers Thomas. would have agreed with the fact that like his son's op- or his grandson's opportunities were a result of both his hard work and all of the civil rights fighting because Myers Anderson was a dedicated member of the NAACP. He earned he earned the nickname in town sharpshooter for the skill with which he targeted boycotts against racist white businesses. Um, <laughs> he is again, like he's that. like a hard dude, but you also get the feeling <laughs> right. that if you're fighting on like you want this motherfucker on your side in a fight. Yeah, you know, like right. he's he's good uh, hey well, what's he like oh i mean he's the worst fucking grandparent <laughs> he is a shitty uh, grandpa but, but you know what he an ally though he, uh, yeah yeah he's down <laughs> uh he provided the naacp chapter with free heating fuel in the winter at the expense of his business um one friend of the so clearly he didn't think that it was bad for them to have heating i don't know like right. i don't know how to parse that all out <laughs> It's all very, yeah, everything's very conditional. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. One friend of the family at the time noted that Clarence attended a few NAACP meetings as a boy, but he was at boarding school for a lot of the time, right? Um, And a a number of, like, folks who grew, like, grew up with him and report on this time will say that, like, while they were doing NAACP stuff, he was at boarding school, quote, surrounded by whites. Um, Mm -hmm. Clarence recalls his school differently. Uh, He describes it as an entirely black environment, and both of his schools were majority black um it's again we're not ever getting objective when we're talking about the people who knew him or him this is 
everything's filtered through decades of memory because this is all a long mm-hmm. time later and everyone's feelings on the matter too so i don't want to mm-hmm. like put one side or the other as like a hundred percent right about what was going on here. Yeah. You want to yeah. do both sides. Well, at least like, I don't know. I wasn't, no, I'm, just I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not growing up in fucking Savannah, Georgia in 1950s. No, <laughs> um, but it is, it is worth noting that like he benefits from the civil rights struggle, but his grandpa has also put him in a situation where he's not taking part in it, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, it's abstract to him. Yeah, and exactly. He's already has, gigantic chips on both shoulders yeah so, and at least yeah, at, at this point it seems to be kind of it won't be later but that is mm-hmm. he does have that ability as a child that it is kind of abstract um so this is one of those areas where we get into the inconsistencies between how other people describe thomas's youth and how he has described it since once he became a conservative political figure and this happens before he's a supreme court justice he's lobbying for years thomas made a point of claiming in speeches that he would give for things like the federalist society and all these colleges he would always make the claim that he had succeeded in spite of a low quality education right uh in one 1988 speech he told an audience quote i don't understand how it is that people today are getting worse educations than i received in the segregated schools of savannah now we already know that like that's not a hundred percent accurate right like just based Mm -hmm. on his actual background because he went to a very high quality series of private schools right right right. um now obviously like there's a lot to say about that but he it's just not true like the things that he would claim about his education Mm -hmm. um and he's obviously as a right winger he's claiming that in order to be like look the schools don't need more money no the poor schools that i went to did a better job than modern schools there's some cultural thing that's making the schools bad where it's like no man your grandpa paid for you to go to a great private school dude like yeah he's he's playing yeah he's mr ultimate bootstraps yeah and it's shit. fine like it's good yeah. that your grandpa did that for you but like don't pretend that you like w- had a hard scrabble scrabble public school education because you didn't well i think that's like the thing yeah. right because if if there's a fork in the road of your like choose your own myth making mm-hmm. adventure you want to choose the against all odds right version right. no because that's part of especially in with america like ev- most people want to obscure the fact yeah. that like you know they're like generational uh they were generationally admitted to like an ivy league school and like no nah, yeah. man like it was all hard graft i, I came from the nowhere well, and it, yeah and i think for him too that really helps for like multiple levels to be like yeah i went to a shitty school that's why they don't need anything and also look what i did folks yeah lifted it, myself out it's fucked up because like obviously there's a fuckload of kids and family members of his who grew up in pinpoint who could have gone as far as he did, or at least like gone a hell of a lot further than they did in the the capitalist sense of the word, but didn't because they had to grow up in pinpoint picking fish out of like shells and stuff because that was mm-hmm. the only opportunity they got. He gets, thankfully, um, like luckily, I should say, uh, he gets an opportunity because of his, who you know, who his grandfather is. Um, but he doesn't like to acknowledge that in the future, except for like when he, he does, he has to, he does acknowledge his grandfather, but always in the, the way his hardness shaped him as opposed to the way his resources provided opportunities. And I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so (laughs) this, yeah. Just like the, wow, yeah, that it's always, I was just carved out of my grandpa's sternness. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's it, it makes sense that this is like the way he's going to claim it. Um, so this next bit gets into some territory that is definitely uncomfortable and difficult for me to parse out well. Um, but we're going to talk about the specific kind of racism that Clarence dealt with in his youth. Um, mm. And a lot of it did not come from where I think at least where I would have expected being a fucking white dude who did not grow up in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I'm going to quote from a write-up in The New Yorker here. His nickname in the schoolyard in the streets was ABC, America's Blackest Child. If he were any blacker, his classmates jeered, he'd be blue. Color Mm. was code for class. The darkness of Thomas's skin, along with the Gullah Geechee dialect he retained from Pinpoint, was a sign of his lowly status and origin. For Thomas, these cruelties are a lifelong hurt. People love to talk about conflicts interracially, he told the reporter Ken Foskett, who published a biography of Thomas, Judging Thomas, in 2004. They never talk about the conflicts and tensions intraracially. From a young age, the primary divide Thomas had to confront came from the privileges associated with black wealth and light skin. You had the black elite, the school teachers, the light skinned people, the dentists, the doctors, Thomas has said. My grandfather was down at the bottom. They would look down on him. Everybody tries to gloss over that now, but it was the reality. Hmm. And... You know, that is Thomas's. And again, other folks 
you know, have different yeah. recollections, but this is what he recalls of like what he deals with as a kid. I mean, um, yeah, at every, at every turn and get like, right. That there's, he grew up having already feeling inferior as like a black kid because mm -hmm. of the community he grew up in. And then on top of that, the colorism shit comes into it as well and makes him even more his resentment. Yeah. It becomes like, Oh, my God, it, it, what, one of the things at every again at every fucking level. Yeah, there's no he has no he doesn't belong anywhere. Yeah, or, and feels like he has a bone to pick with everything. And you see how that leads to the man he becomes in this like this ideology of self reliance, which is a fantasy. But like you get how someone who comes who grows up feeling like they don't have a place anywhere. Right. Grows up with this attitude towards self-reliance. Now, of course, the reality, as we've talked about, is that like he benefited tremendously from a community that fought for his his rights, even though right. it does seem like maybe that it didn't feel that way to him. But like that was right. what was going on. His grandfather was a part of that. Um, it's very bleak that this is kind of a lot of what he seems to take out of the period. Well, and, um, and, and again, for all of his like right wing mm -hmm. white supporters, he's yeah. the version of blackness that they wished every other black person. Would yeah. Like, where it's like, it wasn't really an issue, actually. Yeah. If you, there's racism, it's between black people. Exactly. Exactly. And that his narrative doesn't offend anyone or take notice of the struggle that pretty much every other uh, black person in the country had to, to yeah. face. Yeah. It's, it's again, a lot going on here. Yeah. Like um, yeah. Everything's <laughs> now 5D, 6D, 9D yeah. chess now. After high school, Clarence enters the seminary. Um, his grandpa wanted him to be a Catholic priest. He's really, really approving of this mood uh, move. It's probably one of the few things that like Clarence gets like some kind of like expression of pride from his grandfather for doing. Because um, mm -hmm. that's like, man, if you're a fucking Catholic priest, you're that's like at least for Catholics, about the height of, like, uh, respectability, yeah. you know. All right, family. man. That's um, cool. So he gets admitted to a pre-study program, because being a priest is kind of like being a doctor, um, <laughs> in 1964. Uh, this is the year that Congress... Who would you rather have operate on you, Robert? Uh, a priest, of course. Um, because <laughs> yeah, the doctors true. are just going to put that fucking Bill Gates chip in me, Miles. Excellent. Thank that's you. right. That Bill All Gates right. chip. You glad know the you one I'm talking for that about. Bait. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't fall for that pro science bullshit. Well, I, I don't know. You see, Miles, you've I don't believe in the Bill Gates chip in the vaccine. I believe that Bill Gates is putting chips inside of all of us that allows him oh, to control yeah. when we orgasm. And that's oh, why you can't go to the doctor. Stay oh, away from the doctor. Okay. I didn't think I didn't hear about this. Mm -hmm. Yep. The Bill this, Gates okay, come chip. Look sense. it up. Go to Bill Gates come ship. Chip or ship. That's a different thing. Oh, though, no, this that he does whoa, have a cum ship. Whoa. Yes. Miles, go to reddit.com and type okay. in Bill Gates cum chip or Bill Gates cum ship. Um, yeah. And you'll get cum ship is very interesting. Yeah. There's a lot going on with the cum ship. Um, okay. Um, so anyway, you, we, we digress. We digress to our ads because, Miles, this podcast is sponsored by Bill Gates cum ship and cum chips. <laughs> Let Bill Gates be your one-stop shop for semen. For the makers of Ah, oh, we're back. So, 1964, the year he gets admitted to his pre-study program for, for seminary. Again, semen. Come. Mm. Perfect. Uh, that's the year also that, uh, that Congress debates the Civil Rights Act. Uh, the rector of the seminary he goes to, William Coleman, is a progressive, uh, and he chose to offer Clarence and one other black student scholarships uh, in order to make sure that there wouldn't just be white priests, right? Like, that's, it's kind of an affirmative action program, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and he and his brother are the, or he and the, this other student are the first black people admitted to this particular seminary. Um, prior to starting priest school, Clarence had been awkward and uncomfortable around women. Uh, friends noted that he seemed to nurse a deep well of resentment towards his mother and becoming a, or learning, uh, doing the pre-study for becoming a Catholic priest did not help with this part of his life. Oh. From Strange Justice, quote, if Thomas was unsophisticated about girls, certainly the nuns had done little to change that. The only sex education the youngsters at St. Benedict's and St. Pius X received, recalled Johnson, was from their own parents, which Thomas lacked. After sixth grade, boys and girls were separated 
it in class. And uh, Johnson is one of the other students there recalls, we were lectured about sin all the time. The nun's view of women at that time, according to Carol Delaney, who was taught by them in Savannah, was that we should become wives and mothers and submit completely to male authority. The husband was the head of the wife as Christ was the head of the church. Women were associated with sin through Eve. So again, this is the <sighs> good, I mean, well, this is now seminary. Yeah. So this is yeah. what he's learning. You're, um, the, you're the main character in a religious video game yeah. where you have to fight the evil women mm -hmm. and, but you're a incel pretending you're Volcel. Yeah. Um, and it's, <sighs> there's a lot to be said by someone who is better at analyzing these things than me of like the similarities between his grandpa's attitude towards like, well, I'm not going to raise a girl. That's not worth right. it to what these priests and nuns are teaching him about yeah. women, right? I would like, do the nuns uh, ever go, and I'm bad too. I suck I'm so hard. I'm actually, get the, I'm a serpent. Okay, I am the mother the of, of sin. Of <laughs> um, Why am I here? I gotta go. I'm bad. So according to him, he's a pretty good student at seminary, but he is also kind of becomes in this point constantly infuriated by the racism he encounters from the other mm -hmm. students because again it's just him and one other black student everybody else is white as hell um he later recalled one night when the lights were turned off and a classmate said quote smile clarence so we can see you mm -hmm. yeah um he was particularly bothered he says later not by the fact that people laughed but by the fact that nobody came to his defense right he has like these friends and they won't stick up for him um oh, which oh my god yep I don't have any trouble believing that. Um, he reached a snapping point in 1968 during his first year at the actual seminary, right? Because he has to do preschool for priests. Pre, pre cum. Yeah, he's got a pre cum before he can get to be real <laughs> semen. Full seminary. So when he when he joins that big cum shot, um, he learns. Oh boy, no, I. Should, that's not a good way to lead into that line. No. Um, so during his first year at the actual seminary. Um, you know, it's 68, which is the year that Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. Mm -hmm. um, and when that happens, he recalls a classmate says to him, good, I hope the SOB dies. I think because there was lag time in between him being shot. And, yeah. Yeah. Finding out. Um, right. So Clarence says that racism is why he ultimately quits the seminary. His grandfather is fucking furious at this, <sighs> right? Like. Obviously, if you know anything about Myers Anderson, the fact that you encountered racism in seminary is not an excuse to not become a priest yeah. to that guy, right? Like, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, over a little bit of racism? Yeah. Let me tell you about racism. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, this doesn't go over well. His grandfather throws him out of the house. In his memoir, Thomas would later write, he'd never accepted any of my excuses for failure, and he wasn't going to start now. You've let me down, he said. For years, the two remained estranged, and Myers Anderson refused to attend his grandson's graduations or wedding. <laughs> oh, my God. I know, it, wait, right? Who, it's who, so who fucking that? bleak. Is that according to Thomas or that's according to someone else? That is according to Thomas. I have not heard any counter to that story, though. Okay, but yeah, Jesus. Now, there's a couple of things that are left out. One of them is that a big part of why Myers becomes angry is that when his son, because he's going to go on to become a lawyer and he's going mm. to justify it because when he drops out of preschool, he's like, well, I've decided I want to become a lawyer so that I can help the community, right? So that I can fight for civil rights. And he never mm -hmm. does this. So a thing that is left out of this, people will claim who knew the family at the time, is that Myers was also angry that he doesn't do that part of it. So right, I don't know. Right, right. Again, we all tell stories about our pasts. Um, right. So one of the nuns who- Did I ever tell you about that helicopter I was in that got shot down? No. I'll tell you, maybe, maybe you can have me oh, for another Okay, episode. so you're not yeah, gonna, you're not gonna give us the helicopter story right now. You're just bringing that up, nah, just teasing nah, that? Nah. I'm just saying I was with a lot of brave men and women that day. Well, uh -huh. I was in a helicopter once with, with William Gates. Uh, we were heading towards an <laughs> island, uh, a friend of ours, buddy named Jeff owned. Um, little island, just out in the, anyway. Um, <laughs> No, so, you don't think that's a good. You don't think that's a good bit. I think that's a terrible <laughs> bit. You don't think the hung out on Epstein's island bit has legs? <laughs> uh, I don't know why we've gotten into this territory. Yeah, today. why are you doing this? It doesn't make you look very good or cool. 
It's because the word semen is kind of in seminary and in yeah. seminary, that's also kind of funny. And then there's like oh pre seminary. So then it's yeah, priests sorry. are always. This yeah. is, why that's are, what I mean. Like, this is not a good. This is not a good bit. No. This is, and I'm not a good guest to have for serious things, you know. So yeah. I apologize. I don't know why you're, you're like going back to your discussion. middle school humor for this episode, Robert. It's, it's kind of. You know, it's not your thing. It is my thing, Sophie. It's mm-hmm. always been my thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's my thing. It is too my thing. Yeah. Well, you'll see it's how like many more times. It's like three years ago. So it's the middle schooler. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to teach everybody how many times I can say come in a four-part series about <laughs> Clarence Thomas. It's actually very appropriate given some weird things that he does to all of his coworkers. Anyway, we'll oh. talk about that later. <gasps> Um, so one of the nuns who likes him, right? Cause he decides to quit. And apparently one of his nuns is like, Hey, if you're not going to be a priest, why don't you go to Holy Cross, which is a Catholic college in Worcester? I think it's pronounced Worcester, Massachusetts. It is spelled Worcester. I'm yeah, so angry. Worcester fucking nonsense. Um, so this is a white liberal <laughs> college, uh, which you might expect to have been better than the seminary in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, It is not. Um, After 1968, it had decided to actually try and recruit black students. Um, And in order to do that, they set up a a scholarship fund uh, named after Martin Luther King. Um, And Thomas receives one of these scholarships to go to the school that he would not have been able to afford otherwise, which is, again, the second time that he's he's benefited from an affirmative action program. To summarize his time in college, I want to quote from the book, The Enigma of Clarence Thomas, quote, Moving to a white institution in the North repeated the trauma of moving to a white seminary in the South, which Thomas described in an interview with The Crisis, the magazine of the NAACP, thus, quote, so you leave that all black environment and you go into an environment where you are the only black and you are sitting where you live day in, day out and attend classes. And the only blacks you see are the two women who work in the kitchen and the rest are white people. You go through some changes, going through those changes in the charged context of an integrating northern college campus surrounded by the tenants and tech of black nationalism transformed him. It was a special time in my life, he says. In later years, Thomas would downplay the presence of black nationalism in his mature thinking, hotly declaring, I'm not a nationalist. Yet he never disavowed its role in his development, going so far as to invoke Malcolm X as an analog for precedent or precedent in his biography. I have been angry enough in my life, and there are some points where I'm sure my attitudes approached black nationalism. I'm certain you could say the same thing about Malcolm X. In college, Thomas's black friends loved to tease him about the fervor of his commitment and the seriousness of his study. What woman would want this man anyway? He's into books and black power. But even as a Supreme Court justice looking back on his youthful development, Thomas refused to mock the moment. I was an angry black man, he wrote in his memoir. The more I read about the black power movement, the more I wanted to be a part of it. I used to be an angry black man. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> like mm, you were i mean that's one way to describe you really getting in touch with uh, the oppression that yeah have felt. and he does have this brief period of being not just in touch with oppression but like actually committed to doing something about it right um he is like he is a combat boots and black panther beret type activist um, are there pictures of him like then i don't know i haven't found any um, that's like the that the, oh my god that's the most fucked up picture to like look at probably right yeah now. Like, Ooh, I'm sorry, boy what? Um, and his his first trip to Washington, D.C., the very first time he ever goes, is a march on the Pentagon against the Vietnam War. Um, the last protest he ever goes to turns into a massive street bar- brawl where 2,000 cops assault 3,000 protesters demanding the release of Black Panther co-founder Bobby Seale uh, and a prominent leading Panther, Erica Huggins. Um, years later, Thomas would insist, quote, I was never a liberal. I was a radical. And and this seems to be true. Wow. He organizes a free breakfast program for kids in Wooster, patterned off of what the Black Panthers had done. Um, he supports Communist Party member Angela Davis in her flight from the U.S. government. He helps what? organize a black student union at his college. Uh, and he also publishes a manifesto in that magazine that is extremely black nationalist with lines like, quote, the black man does not want or need the white woman. The black man's history shows that the white woman is the cause of his failure to be be the true black man. Wow. <laughs> I know, right? It's wow. Clarence Thomas. I don't think that's a, a not going to be a, a a a twist a lot of people see coming. Um so then like if, if it's like a cheesy narrative like he has to I wonder what the moment is that he goes to the dark side. 
like if he was a Jedi before. Yeah, it, I think part that of he it is then, that like, inverts. he is always, even when he is on this radical side, he's fundamentally rooted in some pretty regressive things. As we're going to cover, a big part of what he believes in as a radical in this period is also the subjugation of women by men, which a lot of left-wing right. 60s radicals, number one, a, there's been a great deal written and a lot by female panthers about sexism mm -hmm. they encountered from these guys who were otherwise heroes of the black panther movement because again there was a lot of misogyny in the panthers right. and then there's guys like stokey carmichael right of students for a democratic society who had a quote that was something like what is the purpose of like a woman in the sds and he's like well it's for us to fuck right like that was mm -hmm. again it is still the 60s <laughs> right yeah right, right. It's um, like there are still limits to what we are capable of thinking about yeah it, but yeah that's it, wild that even for him he's like yeah man like i'm still he's like white women mm -hmm. are the devil yeah <laughs> see well, still on theme for me and it's also like you can talk about misogyny within a lot of these left-wing circles and black nationalist circles in the same way that like yeah man if you went to fucking woodstock about it around a bunch of open-minded hippies and like were a man and kissed another man you would probably get beaten within an inch of your life because like they're still pretty homophobic, you know? Right, right, Like, right. it was yeah. 1969. Yeah, yeah, um, it's not 2040. Yeah. <laughs> Optimistic, Miles. <laughs> um, so I want to quote next from a write-up by The New Yorker. Quote, after the BSU learned that a member was dating a white woman, the student convened, the group convened a mock trial, found him guilty, and broke his Afro comb as punishment. Thomas took the role more seriously, particularly after meeting Kathy Ambush, a black woman who he, whom he would marry in 1971 and divorce in 1984. In a poem he called, Is You Is or Is You Ain't a Brother, he set out the obligations of black men to black women. Even in that milieu, Kevin Merida and Michael Fletcher reported in their 2007 biography, Supreme Discomfort, Thomas's edgy race consciousness stood out. When he saw an interracial couple strolling on campus, he'd loudly demand, do I see a black woman with a white man? How could that be? Until 1986, when Thomas met Virginia Lamp, who was white and who would become his second wife, he opposed interracial marriage and sex. What? Oh, He's a real, like, there's a lot going on in this guy. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. I, it makes me, I, it makes, first of all, it makes my brain hurt. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about how if he really was like trying to reverse like the loving decision, yeah. that's like him being like, no, I really feel this way and I'm going to live that and I'm, I'm regressing to this very bizarre intersection of my beliefs and you're like, what the fuck, where? And Who it, are you? You also see, it's interesting because you can see, number one, there's a lot of consistency in his belief towards women and what rights women 100%. should have. And also, and a certain flexibility when he wants something, right? Because he meets a white woman that he likes and then he's like, okay, well now I'm not against interracial marriage, right? Oh, you um, know, not all white women are. Yeah, exactly. I mean, come on, I was kind of tripping when it, I wrote that rap song. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, and this is, I guess this is, all, this is number one, a very human thing, but also it's like a very conservative thing. Like you can think about John McCain being like the only Republican being like, we shouldn't torture people. Why? Well, because I got tortured once, so yeah. I know it's bad. <laughs> Uh, all right, why don't you brag about it? Yeah. Um, I don't know. People are complicated and generally hypocrites. Um, but you know who's not a hypocrite, Miles? Hmm. You. When you plug your products or pod, whatever. Miles, mm -hmm. it's the end of the episode. Say some mm. things that people can find you at. Oh, you can find me just at Miles of Gray on mm. uh, Twitter and Instagram. And if you like, uh, you know, I, I do a daily show about news and politics and stuff called Daily Zeitgeist. You mm -hmm. can listen to that every day. Or if you like trash reality TV, because that's what I do to avoid thinking about <laughs> our crumbling earth. Yeah. Uh, check me out on 420 Day Fiance, where I get high and talk about 90 Day Fiance. Check out Sophie Alexander. Miles on the Daily Zeitgeist. On mm -hmm. 420 Day Fiance, play both at the same time from different yeah. devices. Mm -hmm. um, they sync up in a way that will reveal secrets to you about mm -hmm. how to gain special powers. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you can even listen to, I have a third show because I can't stop talking mm -hmm. called Miles and Jack Got Mad Boosties where I'm just talking about basketball. So a lot of, mm -hmm. you can get your serious or your frivolous. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Adam Sandler basketball movie at Miles. Hustle, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I thought, I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was pretty yeah. good. I was telling Sophie. Somebody. 
There's like a million scenes in that where like I know a famous ba basketball player just walked on scene and I'm supposed mm -hmm. to be like, oh my God, it's that guy. But <laughs> I can't tell if they're actors or not. Because <laughs> to me, it's just like, wow, everyone's very tall in this movie except for Have Adam Sandler. It? Sophie? Mm -mm. D James Goldstein is even uh, has a cameo. I don't know who that is. <laughs> That's how like there's these like deep cut basketball people in it. I didn't realize the Spanish guy who's the second main character is an actual basketballer yeah a basketballsman <laughs> exactly thank you mm -hmm. speaking of balls the episode's over we did it guys boom behind the bastards is a production of cool zone media for more from cool zone media visit our website coolzonemedia.com or check us out on the iHeartRadio app apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts